Thank you all for joining us so early in the morning. Hi there. My name is Alexis Badenmer. I'm with Regeneration International. We are your hosts today, and I would like to thank our partners for inviting you, because I know many of you came because Martha Holdridge of Grass Power invited you, or Seth Itzkin from Soil for Climate, or Sudhir Sukla from Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, or Elizabeth Kucinich from Rodale Institute. So I want to thank our partners for getting the word out and encouraging you all to attend. <laughs> our first speaker is Dr. Tim LaSalle. He was the research director at the Howard G. Buffett Foundation's Ukulima Farm in South Africa, where he worked on soil health initiatives to improve the productivity of smallholder farmers. LaSalle is the former CEO of the Rodale Institute and has also led the Northwest Earth Institute, the Environmental Center of San Luis Obispo County, the Allen Savory Center for Holistic Management, and the California Agricultural Leadership Program. Earlier in his career, he was a, a full professor at California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, California, where he taught a range of dairy science classes. Thank you so much for being with us, Tim. Tim is the first person that I learned about this from, so I'm so happy to have him here presenting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. And thank you for Regeneration International hosting this. Perhaps one of the most important topics, not perhaps, and in my mind it is the most important topic for us to be dealing with, because when we come to the issue of climate change, we know by people that have been informing us about this for years, Jim Hansen or Al Gore, that we are probably past the brink. And nobody is really talking about, is there anything that can draw it down? If you read Naomi Klein's book, uh, many of the conclusions are we don't have the technological capacity to actually reverse the negative impacts of climate change, and we're on a course of at least disassembly of civilization as we know it. So we know that we've been in a place, I don't know, this thing looks like it's on a timer, we, we know that we have been in a place of overshooting our resources, but also overshooting from the standpoint of what we're leaving as residue. And as regarding greenhouse gases, this has been a huge challenge, of course. And in essence, agriculture is a significant contributor. And that's why I love the symbol, Alexis, that you have here on regeneration, because you have an arrow going down as well as one coming up. It's a matter now, we found, that we actually have to rebuild systems, and the atmosphere is one of those, of course. You know, years ago at the Copenhagen Accords on Climate Change, Andrew Liu, the next speaker, and I were the only two really pounding on the table saying soils could make a difference. It could be the key. And the beauty is, nine years later, a lot of wonderful people and some of the scientists here today have been finding the kinds of numbers that are affirming this in spades. We're understanding now that there is a way forward, and it's exciting, and it challenges the precepts that we've held in the past about what could or could not be. You know, as we talk about carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases increasing, Bill McKibben, of course, came forward and said, we need to shoot for 350, and that's livable. Well, that number itself has been challenged dramatically now, that it may not be livable. And we know we're past 400, and so this question comes back to is can we come back to what really sustained a climate that could produce food and would give us weather patterns to really give us a chance for civilizations to survive around the world? After spending four years in Africa, one of the things that I learned quickly was is the climate prognosticators told us that Africa would be affected first. And I can attest to that. Even the most illiterate farmer, who could certainly say, well, I'm not a scientist, did tell us climate change is here, and we are suffering. They used to, in most places, plant by date because the rains came. And now they know that has been dramatically disrupted. The sad thing to me was is they blamed themselves because they cut their trees. And, yeah, that was not good. Little did they know that we, as American consumers, were putting a lot more carbon dioxide in the air than their effect on their own future. So what struck me and things that I learned um, when I went to the Rodale Institute was, if we looked at the data that was there, all in the can, as they would say, is carbon matters. 
And so, so much in agriculture, we talk about, well, we've got to get the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium in the soil, or the, or the micronutrients. But nowhere is in that fertility consciousness is there a discussion around carbon. That's what feeds the life cycles. We have two great microbiologists here today that will be talking about those. And without the carbon, we have a sterile medium that's not going to feed the life cycles and build resiliency and actually build soil. Uh, not only that, as we take it out of the atmosphere and put it down there, we get multiple ecosystem services, let alone atmospheric cleansing. So what about that carbon? We need to put it back in the soil. So we know when we plow our fields, we release carbon, because uh, soil breathes and releases carbon dioxide. But when you plow it, you get more oxygen and you stimulate and you release even more. So agriculture is a major contributor, first really from fertilizers and the fossil fuels it uses in its tractors, but in its plowing. And so agriculture needs to change, as we talk about reducing emissions or stopping them, our practices in agriculture has to change as well and go more in this regenerative model. If we look at this slide and we see that uh, no-till, which is the 300 kilograms per hectare per year sequestration, that's actually a plus or minus 700 kilograms, so as you see, you're either putting away some or maybe losing some. No-till is important, and that will be forwarded a lot. It's important for a number of reasons, but as you see, it's sort of the low average. When we start to add cover crops into the system, we jump here, it says, winter cover crops is 744 kgs per hectare. So that starts stacking practices, doing no-till and cover crops. We're starting to jump that system. If we have access to compost, and this was a study done designed by USDA, run by USDA, it happened to happen on the Rodale farm, it showed applying compost in 10 years only three times, gave an average yearly sequestration rate of over a ton. Now, some of the information we'll hear today is more exciting yet than these numbers. And these uh, scientists that will share this with you today, I don't want to take the wind out of their sails, I'll let them present it, are really on the cutting edge. And I want to make the statement that we need a lot more research, but we don't need a single bit more to act. The time is already at, we're at the brink, and we know enough that we can change some practices now, and we should be acting now while continuing our research. You know, uh, Andre and I often talk about looking for the outliers, the ones that are really showing us the way. And there was a, a, a friend of mine that had come out of the yacht maintenance business and wanted to raise his kids on a farm. So he bought a raisin farm in Fresno. And the old traditional conventional farming just had rows of vines in the sunlight growing grapes. And you cut them in the fall and you lay them on the ground and dry them. He decided, I'm not farming, because he wasn't a farmer to start with, he says, I'm not farming acres of land. I'm farming square inches of photosynthesis. And once we turn that paradigm over, we realize we're trying to jump the amount of photosynthesis that we have in every square inch on that land. And so diversity is important, using all of the sunlight and building as much potential biomass and carbon in the soil as we possibly can. He quadrupled his yields. He cut his labor in half, and he started showing profits that hardly anybody would believe. Well, in Africa, I found a particular bean that would grow very low but very broad, started to plant it between the maize and the corn, and so it filled the space that would be bare ground and started to shade the weeds and started to provide nitrogen, but greatly increased the biomass, therefore using every square inch of photosynthesis capacity in that field and putting more carbon in the ground. It strikes us, too, this conversation also addresses this really kind of not minor discussion point. When we only have 60 years of soil left, according to the UN and FAO, and that's kind of what climatologists are telling us, that's all we really have left with climate change, it's past time. We have to address how we're treating and working with soils for both our atmosphere and the future of producing food. We worked in and out of Burundi and trying to help some of their leaders rethink why they were giving their foreign aid to Egypt for free. 
I teased them with that and showed them this picture on their own hillside saying, you're sending your soil north. Why? Well, it's happening here too. This was a field right next to mine in Africa. And the reason I show this picture is we disked this field only once, only tilled it once in the season. A rainstorm hit. This is loss of soil by one rainstorm. Whereas in my fields that were no-till and biologically farmed, no chemicals put into those systems, soil aggregation, which is the middle jar here, was nearly perfect. As a matter of fact, a scientist from South Africa asked, because we were training some seed growers on conservation agricultural principles, asked that I bring some samples from my field because he wanted to demonstrate. I was nervous. I was farming sand. It's going to just melt in that water. What's he talking about? Well, the field that I just showed you that eroded is the sample on the left. Put it in there, it just melted. It washes away. But the aggregation in the field right next to it, where I was no-tilling and biologically farming, had aggregation because of the biology and not breaking it up with the disk. So we're not just holding soil, we're building it at the same time and sequestering carbon. We have to, in this industry, think in terms of how we disturb the soil less. And this is in Ghana, where we'll show you a sample. These two test plots were done with cowpeas. One season of no-till, and this was basically an organic system too, will show you the difference between the cowpeas in the back and the cowpeas in the front when there was a shortage of rain. It went from food insecurity to food security by simply holding the soil together, leaving mulch on top of the soil, holding what moisture you have, and start to refeed the organisms in the soil itself. So, in summary, what I want to say is, is that regeneration is so crucial to the future of civilization. In building soils for the fertility that really becomes a, a sustainable building of fertility, but also, as we're saying here, from the standpoint of getting the biology very, very healthy. And I'm going to, again, very much leave that discussion to the scientists that are here that can really address those issues. But I add in here just as a thought, and this will come forward today too, and that is that rotational grazing and no-till are important elements of how we're thinking about whole systems. Because this planet only operates as a whole system its atmosphere, its oceans, its water cycles, its carbon cycles, its life cycles, its soil, all only operates as a whole system. And we have to begin to think in terms of those as we begin to approach such really challenging questions as climate and soil loss today. One of the things that strikes me as we've finished and summarized this thought and sort of orienting us of why we're having these conversations today is to say our farmers and our ranchers are really our only avenue forward because there is no technology out there other than photosynthesis and good healthy soils to cleanse the atmospheres and to build the resiliency for the future. It does demand policy discussions and policy change. We desperately want more science, but as I said, we have enough to act today. And that's the most encouraging thing that I think we have to hope for for future generations. And I'm pleased that you are all here to be involved in this discussion. And I hope you have some real good questions, especially for the real experts that will follow me. With that, I'd like to thank you very much.